Nehemiah chapter 2, and we could take a look at verses 1 through 9. Last week we looked at uh, chapter 1, and we talked about the importance of if you are lost, it's time to start climbing, it's time to communicate, it's time to begin to listen and then conform to what he's saying. You know, when I look at what's happening, I realize that this world is in a world of hurt. And it just can't be me. It has to be you. You have to be strong. And I don't think there's ever a time that I can stand before you and say, listen to me very carefully. You better get strong in Jesus Christ. And you better have a great relationship with God because things are going to get tough. When you listen to Russia and all of a sudden, you know, see China and what they can do to the United States if they decide to drop the dollar, it's frightening. It's not going to be months. It's going to be a day. It's going to be overnight. And if you look at what's happening in Israel and the way we're treating Israel, we are in serious trouble. You know, years ago, I could say no problem. But now, if you touch Israel, we're deadly in trouble. And then you look at Iran, and you see missing planes and missing this, missing that. All I can tell you is that never in my life have I ever sensed the urgency of being strong now. And so we don't have time for these problems in our marriages. We need to get it together. The Bible says in the last days, marriages are going to be like not. In other words, we're not going to have these little petty problems. Like you squeeze the toothpaste in the middle. So what? You know, get hers and his and then be fine. But, you know, it's just like enough's enough. And so I chose the book of Nehemiah to try to teach you and myself what it means to be a team player, what it means to really understand how to deal with issues because there's no one in the Bible that I believe more speaks about how to overcome obstacles in your life than Nehemiah. And that's one of the re great reasons. And I believe that we are facing some of the most difficult things we've ever faced in our life. How do we get victory with our children? How do we have victory in our marriage? How do we have victory anywhere in our life? And the answer is very easy. It's when I come to pray and ask God to change me. That's the only thing that's going to happen. And what Satan's seeking to do is bring bitterness and hatred. And all of a sudden, I find myself pulling away from the Lord. And now's not the time to pull. Now's the time to get right with God. And so that means a righteousness has to begin to prevail. Not because the pastor said it, but because down deep in my heart, that's what I want. I want to be righteous. I want to be right with God. And then everything else is going to be in my favor. So he'll make even my enemies be at peace with me. So if you want to eat or you want to see God move, that means that who is going to enjoy that? He that ascends to the hill of the Lord who has clean hands, a pure heart, and who loves the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind. That means there's decisions that have to be made, and that is the most important thing. Now we come to Nehemiah, and he's now faced with one of the biggest problems in his life. He is absolutely overwhelmed. Doesn't know what to do, but begins to pray. And he begins to pray, and what is so interesting, and you don't see it unless you understand this, is that in chapter 1, between chapter 1 and chapter 2, four months have now passed by him. So that tells me Nehemiah has been praying for four months. And that's the thing I want to really drive home today. If you would just give your marriage four more months, if you would just give the kids four more months, if you would just give your job four more months, and you would begin to pray, I believe God could turn the thing around. And so in those four months, four things that he says, he wept and he mourned, and he began to seek God's face and he fasted. And here, all of a sudden, we find Nehemiah again faced with the situation, and boy, does he come out with a great plan. He actually has a plan, and that's what I want to share with you. He has a plan how to attack, and when the time comes, the king now begins to talk to him, he has an answer. So he is able now to answer the king. He's able to stand before the king strong, and he's able to speak with authority. Why? Because when you spend four months praying then all of a sudden the little king goes away and the king of kings begins to stand up. And now you're not afraid any longer. He was a cupbearer, you remember, in chapter 1. Then in chapters 2 all the way through chapter 6, he is now a construction guy. And so we find him rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. In fact, he built those walls in 52 days, which my background is construction. That's impossible. But when the people have a mind to work, anything is possible. And so they worked together, and he brought everybody together, so they worked in their own backyard. 
So I built my backyard, and Pastor Rob built his backyard, and Pastor Pat built his backyard, and we connected the walls, and it was done in 52 days. The two enemies we read about in the book of Nehemiah is Tobiah and Sanballat, and they were against Nehemiah. They hated Nehemiah, and they lied and did everything they could to destroy Nehemiah, but you couldn't touch Nehemiah because he was a righteous man. And because he prayed, he knew what to do. And sometimes if we would just pray, I believe that God would change our heart. Sometimes we run into the presence of God and we just start screaming. And that's fine if that's what you have to do. But there comes a time in your life that you're going to have to stop and listen to what God wants to do. And the reason why we're yelling, the reason why we're not communicating is because we have no confidence in God. And so we begin to take it out in everybody else. You have to understand, against you, God, we have sinned. You and you only have we sinned because we've not waited upon you. You show me somebody that can wait on God, I'll show you a person that's blessed out of his mind. But you have to learn to wait. You're going to be able to run and not fall. You'll be able to mount on the wings of eagles and fly. And you'll be able to do the same stuff day in and day out. They that wait on the Lord is the answer. And so we come and we find out three questions this king is going to ask. So here's a man, not a pastor, just a layperson, that understood what it was to be right with God. And the question he asked, is asked by the king is, number one, why are you so sad? Why are you so sad? And that is a dangerous thing. He was never to be sad. If you were sad, you could die. The king could kill you. But he was sad. Number two, the question is found in verses 4 and 5. What is it you really want, Nehemiah? What do you really want? And then the third question comes out in verse 6 through 9. How long will it take? Now, when I look at these three questions, they're very well put together. That tells me the king of Xerxes was a pretty brilliant king. He asks us three questions right to the point. Number one, what, why are you so sad? Why are you so sad? You're not sad because of your sickness or health. It is a sadness of the soul. Why? Number two, what do you really want? Tell me. What do you really want? And number three, how long is it going to be that you're going to be away before I get you back? Those are three brilliant questions. And because of that, Nehemiah was able to answer every one of them. Sometimes we can't. And the reason why, we don't know. How are you doing? Okay. What's going on? Don't know. How's your marriage? Don't know. How's your kids? Not sure. How's work? I don't know. How's church? It's okay. <laughs> they ought to name you. I don't know. Well, how are you doing? I don't know. I won't, you know, because we don't know. And that's what I hear more and more. There's no drive. There's no plan. There's no thing to get this thing done. All you see is someone sick or all you see is someone has cancer. Okay, you have it. How are you going to get rid of it? What are you going to do? How far are you willing to go? Are you willing to change your habit, change this, change that? How much are you willing to research? In other words, what happened to us? Why are we so discouraged all the time? And I think what Nehemiah is saying is that when you pray, and you pray for four months, and you weep, and you pray, and you seek God with all your heart, you're going to have answers in your life. And sometimes we don't have them. And the reason why, we pray for four days, and we get mad. Why get mad? We shouldn't. We see that the clay is always speaking back to the potter. And yet the potter is the one that's always working in our life. And there's something about the potter you have to understand that he controls the speed of that will. His feet are on that will. He can make it go fast or not. And his fingers, this is so important in your life, his fingers become the circumstances of your life. So if all of a sudden something's happening with your son or something's happening with your daughter or something's happening at home, those are the fingers of God. God is now going to work through situations in your life to get your attention. And he can take that clay, he can dip it in the water and make you more pliable. He can begin to shape you and form you. But when the clay begins to talk back, I don't like what you're doing, then God looks at it and says, what are you doing? I know what I want. Well, no, you don't. I know what I want. Well, I'm the one who made you. No, I'm going to do what I want. No, I'm the one who bought you. No, you don't understand. And God says, I think I do. So he dips his hand in water, speeds it up, and flattens you. And all of a sudden, you feel like a pancake. And so we walk around like pancakes. How are you doing? I'm pancake. What's going on? Pancake. What happened? Pancake. Well, what are you really saying? God put his finger on my life and crushed me. God is now working in my heart. I don't like it. Okay, great. But here's the great thing. God is working. God has not given up. 
His fingers are still going to work in your life. And so he takes those hands, he dips them in the water, and he begins to shape you. And eventually you realize the best thing you can do is be quiet because God has a purpose. You are his poema, his work of art. And God begins to work in you that plan that he has. And it is a wonderful plan. And when he's done, he takes you over to the oven and sticks you in it and smiles and you just bake. So you're going to have to understand that things are going to go wrong in your life because this world is wicked and things are tough, but God is good. But God is going to be victorious in your life unless you don't pray, unless you don't seek him. Then it's going to be one horrible walk with Jesus Christ. It doesn't have to be that way. And so what he's saying is that he was a man full of the Spirit, a man that was able to change a nation, a man who really knew what he wanted because he was a man who understood how important prayer really was in his life. And when you realize what one person can do if they pray, and what did God say? I'm looking for one man to stand in the gap. I'm looking for one person to make a difference in prayer. But I could not find any. I could not find any that really understood the urgency of that one prayer. And we're talking about people spending time with God. And you say, well, I don't know. Well, you have to. Because if you want to know God, that's where it all begins. And so Nehemiah talks about four things in chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. He, number one, mentions patience. Now, how many of us have that word, patience? Do you understand what he's saying? Yeah. One week and get me out of here. No, it might be one year. You might be stuck for 63 years. You know, I can't. Well, you can. In other words, God can give you the patience to endure anything. So are you patient? Well, no, Stephen, I'm not. Would you like to be patient? No, I won't. <laughs> no, I don't. Well, patience is going to have a perfect work in your life. You have to be patient. You say, well, I don't think I want patience. Well, you're never going to have what God wants in your life. If God is going to make you great, if God's going to answer your prayers, you have to be patient. Because here's the situation that you're not being fair. You're not giving God a chance to work on the other end. You want it now, and your husband wants it now, but his heart and your heart are not even together. So God not only has to work in your heart, he also has to work in his heart because maybe he doesn't want you anymore, and that's what you sense, and yet you want him. God has to work in his heart. How long will you give him? You've messed it up for 35 years. Will you give God four months? If you give God a few moments to work in your husband's life, I guarantee you he'll come back and he'll ask you, what do we need to do to make it right? But if you have no patience, if you're out of it, it's not going to happen. And that's what Nehemiah teaches us. If you're going to face a problem, if you're going to have victory in that situation, it doesn't make a difference what it is. It can be children. It can be work. It can be mom and dad. It can be whatever you want it to be. But if you have patience, you can wait on God, and God can wait and get the thing done. Everything is going to work out in its time. And so we read here in verse 1, it came to pass in the month of Nisan, which is the fourth month, and the twelfth year of Xerxes. So in chapter 1, it's the first year, and here it's the fourth month. So four months have went by. That the wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Now remember, I mentioned to you that the cupbearer was more than just a cupbearer. He was one that was the most important person beside the king. He would not only protect the king from drinking poison, he would also protect the king from eating poison. And he would also stand guard at the king's chamber. So the wife could not even go in. Kids could not even go in because most kings were killed by their wives and by their, their sons and daughters. And so he was responsible to letting people in. So Nehemiah had the highest position he could have. But one thing he could not do is be sad. So here's a man that was everything, but he was patient. Now he's waiting for God's timing. He begins to pray. He wants God to be in it. He wants God to make a decision. He wants to know what to do. His heart is in Judah, which is 900 miles away. He can't do anything about it. And yet he's burdened. He's saddened. What does he do? So for four months, he prays, he weeps, he mourns. Finally, one day, he is now driven to answer the question. But how could he do it? He prayed. How could he come up with the right answer? He's been praying. You see, if you have been praying, you don't have to worry about a thing. The moment you open your mouth, the Holy Spirit's going to speak to you. But if you have not prayed, then you should be concerned. 
because your words are going to be twisted, because the enemy is going to have his way, because you're not going to have the voice of God, because you have rebelled against the authority of the Most High God. But if you have humbled yourself and you have come to a place that you realize you don't have an answer, how do I tell this king? How do I communicate with a king that I can't even talk to? That is a pretty tough thing. You might be married to one of these people. How do I get through? You can't. That's what you don't understand. And so what do you do? You yell. You keep yelling, yelling. Keep threatening, threatening. It's not changing a thing. But if you're going to win him, if you're going to win her, if you're going to win those kids back, there has to be another way. And that way is this. For four months, you don't say a word. You ponder. You pray. You say, well, Steve, I can't get nothing done. I know. But when you ponder, God sees it. It says when Nehemiah walked around the rubbish, what did he do? He pondered and he kept those things to himself. What about Mary? When she heard that she was pregnant now by the Holy Spirit, she pondered and she thought about those things. You see, when you start thinking and start pondering things, you start now listening to what God has to say. So in those moments, you begin to hear like, Stephen, you could be wrong. Steve, you're not as righteous as you think you are. Steve, and all of a sudden, the next four months, guess who God is working on? Not my wife, me, which bugs me to death. And sometimes this drives me crazy. I, my wife comes to me and she says, hey, honey, where would you like to eat? I said, no, it doesn't make a difference. Honey, don't do that to me. Honey, I don't want to go down this road. Where would you like to eat tonight? I'm asking you. Honey, I really don't want to answer that question. Just pick a place, I'll take it. Stephen, so when she calls me Stephen, I'm in trouble. Stephen, where would you like to eat? I say, I'd like to go maybe to Outback. I don't want to go there. Why ask me? <laughs> yeah, this drives me crazy. It goes back and forth, back and forth. But, you know, it's kind of cool. But here's what I'm saying is if I would pray, we wouldn't even go down that road. And so sometimes we say, I can fix it. Oh, really? You can fix it. Well, I can get those kids back. Really? Why are they gone? Well, I can really make a difference in this church. Honestly, really, how? Well, I can, no, I don't, I, anything. If you pray, you can make a difference. If you pray, you can win people to Jesus Christ. If you pray, you can hold up your marriage as a witness of Jesus Christ. But if you don't, then everything is based on flesh. So that is what Nehemiah came to grips with. First of all, he felt that he had to pray on every situation. How do I tackle the situation? You have to pray. And by the end of four months, God is going to soften your heart and God is going to soften their hearts. It says in Isaiah 30, verse 15, For thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. Now listen, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. But you said, nay. No, we're going to trust in the horses and chariots. You won't listen to what God wants. You see, when you're praying, you're listening. And then in Psalm 27, verse 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. God, if I don't see you, if I don't hear you, I'm dead. And then in Psalm 37, verse 34, wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to the inheritance of the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. In other words, you are going to see everything because you wait. So blessed are they that wait. And so I begin to realize everything happens. God's timing. God speaks. So number one, can you have a little bit more patience? How do I overcome this horrible obstacle in my life? You have to be patient. Stephen, I've been patient for a whole week. No. You have to give God an opportunity to work on every avenue. Well, how long is it going to take? How big did you mess it up? How many hearts does he have to speak to? What does he have to do in your heart? Does he have to take out the bitterness and greed and resentment? Or are you at a good place in your life? Well, I guess I'm not because I'm not praying. There you go. Let's start there. So prayer is everything in your life. Number two, how do I deal with the obstacles in my life? Nehemiah tells me that I had to be persuaded. He was persuaded. Check it out. In verse 2 and 3, Wherefore the king said to me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? Interesting question. This is nothing else but sorrow of the heart. Good discernment. Then I was very score afraid, and he said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city and the place of my father 
and the sepulchers lie wasted, and the skates thereof are consumed with fire. Bless your heart, Nehemiah, because you've been praying for four months. Now the time comes. The king asked you a question. What are you going to do? You're going to answer it. And you're going to answer it with all the authority and tenderness you can. How can I be happy when everything is falling apart? I'm a Jew, and my people are falling apart. And here I am, serving in the highest place, and my heart's broken. And the king understood deeply that it was not a sickness of sorrow, of of sickness. It was a sorrow of being just almost overwhelmed, discouraged. And so the king asked him, what do you do? But you see here, he was persuaded. Prayer persuaded him that if the king would ask, he would open up. So sometimes you pray, and then all of a sudden, a spouse will come and say, so what do you think we need to do to change our marriage? I don't know. (laughs) What have you been praying for? Marriage? Okay. Now your wife's asking, what do you think we should do? I don't know. Would you like to do anything different? I don't know. Honey, I just, just call me, I don't know. I don't know. And I, I think guys, I don't know. How's your walk? I don't know. How's the church doing? I don't know. How are you doing at work? I don't know. How are you doing? I don't know. How's God doing? I don't know. You don't hear that when people pray. When someone asks you a question and you've been right with God praying, you speak with authority. You men and brethren of Judah, hearken to me. You have crucified the Lord of glory, Peter said. And all of a sudden you find Peter not afraid but absolutely strong. So when all of a sudden the king says, what do you think we should do? He's now able to answer. You will answer everything in your heart. If all of a sudden your son comes and says, dad, I don't understand, you will be able to speak. Because you've been praying for your son for the last four months. When you have a heart of prayer, when you are able to bring your kids and your wife before the king of kings, you will have an answer. And that answer will be prophetic. And that is so important to realize here. He goes on to say, I can't change anything. No, you can't. I can't change a woman's heart, a guy's heart. No, you can't. You can't change a teenager's heart. No, you can't. But when they ask you, you can sure speak the word of God. And you don't have to be ashamed. You have to be persuaded. That if God opens the door, you are going to walk through it. If God puts me on television, I'm going to walk through it. I'm not going to be wishy-washy. I cannot be double-minded. I have to speak the word of the authority. How? Because I've been in the word. And that is so important. Number three, he tackles the situation by how do I know when there's an obstacle in front of me because I am prepared. Now, wait a second. You mean he was patient? Yes. You mean he just waited? No. He prepared. Patience is not waiting. It's being prepared. You use your time, like Pastor Dwight might be out for a whole year. Does that mean he just kind of waits around? No, that means he studies his heart out. Why? Because God's going to do a work in his heart. You don't wait. You prepare. You occupy. You get ready for whatever God's going to do in your heart. And so here he says, not only am I prepared, but now I'm ready to speak. I have a plan, believe it or not. Well, how did you get that plan? I've been praying for four months. You see, when you pray for four months... God speaks. And all of a sudden, he speaks like this. You know, you've been doing this, but I think you should do this. You read your Bible. You ought to go this way, not that way. You ought to yield yourself. You ought to reckon the old man. You ought to do all this, and I've been doing this, 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 this. And all of a sudden, you realize why there's so many fighting going on and why there's so much lust going on because I'm not doing it God's way. But when you're quiet before God and praying, a couple things are going to happen right off the bat. Number one, you are going to have soundness of mind. And secondly, you're going to have an answer. And that's the biggest thing in the whole world. He's prepared. Look at Nehemiah 2.4. Then the king said to me, for what does thou make request? What do you want? I can't believe you, king. You, you really want to know? Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you. I prayed to God of heaven about this. And so in Philippians 4.6, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. I've been praying for four years that God would soften your heart. He holds your heart in his hand, King. I've been asking God to work in both of our lives. You ask me, I'm going to tell you. And all of a sudden, he's not a cupbearer. He's a leader. Not, he's not anything except a prophet at this moment. He's going to speak the word. That's what happens in your life. All of a sudden, you had no answers. You have answers. All of a sudden, your wife is saying, you don't know anything. You know everything. Everything changes because now you've been with God. It's like one moment you've been in the cesspool. Next moment, you've been with the lilies. How do you smell? Well, yesterday I smelled like the cesspool. Today I smell like the lilies. Who are you hanging out with? And when all of a sudden you're hanging out with God, 
every day asking God to bless you and other people. I'm telling you, God is going to give you confidence. God's going to give you boldness. And God is going to give you assurance. And when people ask you, you're going to have an answer for them. It's not going to be something you have to make up. It's going to have to be something that's in your heart. You're not afraid ever again. And so I read in Psalm 37, verse 5, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth thy righteousness as a light and judgment of the noonday. In other words, man, I'm prepared. I've been praying. I have, a, I have a plan. And the very last thing he does, we find in verses 5 through 9, how do I deal with this obstacle by being persistent? And this is what's so cool. All of a sudden, I have a plan. This is my plan. You want to hear it? I do. Okay, here it is. Number one, I need three things from you, King. In verses 7, 5 and 6, I need your permission. Secondly, I need your provision. And third, I need your protection. Now, how can a man say that to a king? Because he's not afraid of the king. What happened? Well, when you hang out with God for four months, you're not afraid of anybody. When you hang out with God, you're not afraid of any boss ever again. You start understanding who you are in Jesus Christ. You're not going to be abusive. You're not going to be mean. You're going to be sweet, but you're going to be strong. You're going to understand that you're the mom. You're the dad. They're the kid. You have to make decisions. You have to understand you're the husband. You have to take care of your wife. You have to understand that you're a child. You have to submit to your parents. You understand things you never understood before. And all of a sudden, you begin to be very persistent. And here's what he says. Number one, you have to have a plan. Here's his plan. I need permission. Verse 5 and 6. I said unto the king, if it pleases, underline the word please. If it pleases the king, and if thy servant has found favor in thy sight, that thou would send me to Judah and to the city of my father, that I may build it. So there he is. He overcomes his fear. He was afraid of asking the king. Now he's asking the king to give him a letter. The king said to me, and the queen also sat next to him, For how long will thy journey be? And when will thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. I, I had this thing worked out in my brain. When I spend time with God, I have answers. I don't procrastinate. The only time I procrastinate is when I have not spent time with Jesus. I'm afraid to make a decision. But when I hang out with God, fine. I need three things. I want to build the walls. I can build the walls. I have to have a plan. Here's the plan. I'm going to start with prayer. Then I'm going to persuade my heart that God's with me. And then I'm going to open the door. I'm going to tell him like it is. And I'm going to tell him exactly what needs to be done. Number two, not only do I need your permission, but I need your provision. Check it out, verse 7 and 8. Moreover, I said unto the king, if it pleases the king, let letters, again, please, if it pleases the king, verse 7. If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me, to the governor beyond the river, that they may give, help me as I journey. In other words, help me get across the border. And then verse 8, I need a second letter to the keepers of the king's forest, that he may give me timber for the beams of the gates of the palace, which uh, pertain to the house, and for the walls of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good, here it is, the good hand, of God upon me. You see, he dreamt. He knew exactly what he needed. He needed four by sixes, four by eights. He needed plywood. He needed all this stuff. But I got it because of the good hand of God upon me. And lastly, I need your protection. I need your protection. Check out verse 9. Then I came to the governor beyond the river and gave them the king's letter. This is the king over all the earth at this time. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. Huh? What? Nehemiah, I'm going to send my army with you. <laughs> I want you back. I know, King. But I don't want anything to happen to you because I can't live without you. You are the best. You are the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I sleep every night because I have faith in you. How did it happen? Did he just make it happen? No. See, that's what we think. What does he teach us? He spent four months on his knees, fasting, praying, seeking, and mourning. It was in those months that God changed his heart and made him strong. Took away the fear that he had and gave him the strength to speak faithfully about what 
needed to get done. And when it was time, he said, I need to go. Okay. But I need three things from you. I need permission. I need provision. And I need protection. You got it. How long are you going to be? About three years, King. Okay. I'll see you when you get back. There's no way to attack anything except this way. Now, you can attack it your way. It won't get done. You're going to say things you wish you wouldn't. You're going to hurt people. You're going to put your way back. God loves you. God's going to help you. But you'll drive the kids away. If you do it this way, God will make even your enemies be at peace with you. This is the way we got to go. we got to pray for this government. we got to pray for this city. we got to pray for our marriages. we got to pray for our widowhoods. we have to pray for our singlehood. If we don't do that, we can't stand. Father, I pray that God today, you would show us that how Nehemiah attacked the situation. God, in some ways, I think he is one of the most brilliant of all the administrators in the Bible. God, he was not a pastor. He was not a leader. He just was a common guy. But he had a gift of facilitating. He had a gift of organizing. But the first thing he did as a great leader is he humbled himself before you. And he got inside of his heart and he gave you what you had to have, patience. And he allowed you four months to work. And then he was able to stand against every while of the enemy. So God, would you teach us that we haven't given you enough time to work? And God, would you teach us that if we could give you four months, you could turn the world upside down? Do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand?